And now I'd like to introduce this morning's moderator, Sim Siegel, Program Director and Senior Lecturer of the ERM Program and the President of Symergy Consulting. Sim. Thank you, Jay. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, joining us today. Uh, we're proud to bring you today's event, which is another edition of our uh, most favorite event, the CRO Spotlight Series, which features one-on-one -on -one interviews with leading chief risk officers. Uh, I'll now introduce my, myself uh, and our featured guest. Now, I'm Sim Siegel. I'm founder and director of the ERM program uh, here at Columbia University, which is the largest such program globally. I'm also president of Symergy, a boutique ERM consulting firm I founded 13 years ago now, uh, <clears throat> focused exclusively on on ERM serving corporate entities across a range of sectors. I'm also author of a book on uh, enterprise risk management called the Corporate Value of Enterprise Risk Management published by Wiley. I wrote it uh, for executives to help them advance their ERM practices, but it's since also been adopted as required reading on the syllabi of the Society of Actuaries, which is my, my chosen profession and leading universities in the US, the UK, uh, China, where it's been translated into Chinese, Australia, Italy, Croatia, Egypt, and as I learned, a client not too long ago, also Jamaica. It is my honor to introduce our featured Chief Risk Officer, Simeon Fishman. Simeon Fishman is the Executive Vice President and CRO of The Clearinghouse. In this role, Simeon is responsible for the oversight of the company's identification, measurement, management of its risk, <coughs> management of its risk, such that it operates prudently within its risk appetite. Simeon joined the Clearinghouse in 2020 as Senior Vice President, Head of ERM, and was elevated to his current position of CRO in March 2022. Simeon has more than 20 years of experience in risk management at top-tier financial institutions, including sell-side, buy-side, and fintech firms. Prior to joining the Clearinghouse, he, all, he held uh, various senior risk management positions at J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and AQR Capital Management, in which he was responsible for establishing risk frameworks and building out risk assessments, controls, and risk analytics initiatives. Simeon holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics and a Master's of Science in Information Technology from both the University of London and England, and holds certification as a financial risk manager with GARP. So, uh, welcome, Simeon. Uh, please excuse my note taking. It helps me focus uh, on on the answers that Doing that, the same thing. that you <laughs> that you'll be giving uh, the audience and myself. Uh, so, before we begin, can you just give us uh, an overview of of the clearinghouse? Sure. Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me here. Um, when Sim and I uh, caught up just for a little prep talk last last week, it was a little interesting for me because my my family my nickname is Sim too. So it's like there's a one sim risk manager talking to another sim risk manager is a little bit like looking in a mirror. So it was a, it was, a, it was one for setting up, but thank you for, thank you for having me. Um, so the clearinghouse, if you're not familiar, cause I actually, when I joined or when I was um, approached to join the clearinghouse, I had not had a lot of experience with the clearinghouse is a payments uh, network. Um, and it's actually been going for a really long time. It's been going since the 1850s and I kind of, yeah, as I looked at it more, it's really probably one of the the of the US's, if not the world's oldest fintechs. It's a it allows money movement between the largest US financial institutions. We're owned by all the largest banks, Bank of America, Citi, uh, B of A. Um, and we own a few very important uh, payments uh, solutions. So one is CHIPS, which is the large value payment system, which moves over $2 trillion of cash between banks a day. So you can imagine that's uh, that's a big deal. If that falls over, risk management is a little bit important there. <laughs> and we own uh, some other solutions such as uh, EPN, which is a batch-based or ACH-based payments uh, system, which is if you're used to getting a paycheck or paying your, your utility bills, usually um, that's how the banks move money between accounts when you wanna pay your electric bill or pay your rent or, um, or get your paycheck in. Um, that that's a network that is that is used for that, and that's a a, a very large and, and well established network in in the U.S. And then we have more nascent, newer technologies, and the really the future of payments is around real time payments. So you press that button, and instantaneously um, that money goes to the recipient. And we have the the world's uh, or the U.S.'s first uh, first and privately owned through TCH, a real-time payments network. It's been going for a little over five years now. Um, and, uh, and that's the future. And there's obviously, as you can imagine, 
uh, with future. There's new technologies, new business use cases, new clients, um, and what, com what comes with new is risk, right? So that's a, a lot of focus as well. Um, so it, it's a very interesting firm to work with. It's very technology centric, but obviously, obviously being owned by all the largest banks, there's a whole slew of different kinds of risks that we care about at TCH. Uh, gets a lot of visibility given the given the large bank ownership, and there's an international component to it too. Um, so a very interesting place to work. Um, uh, in a, from a technical perspective, it's a nonprofit, but it's not a nonprofit in that it's a um, it could you know the, the the banks will not let it fall. Right, it's something that they rely on very heavily, and we're actually designated uh, predominantly because of chips, our large value payment system by our regulators as a systemically important financial market utility. So if you're less familiar with financial market ut utilities and you have a bit of familiarity on the banks, if you've heard of GSIBs or globally significant uh, important banks, right? Too big to fail, you've probably all heard a little bit about that. We're sort of the equivalent on the financial market utility side. So there's systemic risk importance related to chips and TCH and predominantly because of that, but not just because of that, we're very highly regulated and we have lots of lots of very friendly and, and, and frequent conversations with our friends at the Federal Reserve, the OCC and the FDIC as well. So there's a lot of regulatory components to, to what we do and ensuring that we have solid and robust risk management at, at TCH. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that's helpful in terms of what we do. Sobia, did I get anything wrong? Sobia is here from our ERM team, by the way, Sobia Patel. So, yeah. yeah. So, what I take away from that is indispensable is a great business model. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yes, it that. does help. Yeah. It does help. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, if we could start by asking, what was the impetus that initially launched your program, the specific impetus? Well, you can probably guess the, um, the, the regulatory component was a big one, right? Um, uh, we always had some level of risk management, but when we got designated as a SIFMU, the systemically important financial market utility, uh, all of a sudden there was not just the desire, but the necessity to have really robust and rigorous risk management. Um, ERM is part of our overall risk management program, and it's something that we've evolved, but that was really the impetus. Um, Clearly, if things fall over and go wrong, it's really important to our banks and it's really important to our bank's customers. But when you start looking at it's important to the U.S. financial system, uh, there's no <laughs> there's no debate that you need uh, to really have a, a, a really fulsome and robust risk management program. So I would say when we got designated as a SIF move, I'm going to get my timeline wrong here, but it was maybe, uh, I want to say around sort of seven or eight years ago, that's when the risk management practice started really uh, ramping up and, uh, and focus on making more robust and the ERM uh, function within uh, TCH, the clearinghouse is, uh, is a byproduct of, of that. You, you mentioned in passing that ERM is part of the risk management approach. Everybody defines it differently. So just so we understand where you draw the lines of how it, where the borders are, how you interact, how would you relate and define that? It's a, it's a really good question because I, I think it's really important to distinguish between organizational constructs and business function, right? So when you talk, for, for me in my mind, when you talk about enterprise risk management as a business function, it's the umbrella risk management across the entire organization and how you look at every nuance and factor of risk and how that factors into how the firm makes decisions about what it wants to do um, with a risk-based consideration. Um, in our organization, the way we're structured within the risk office is we have a department that is, is enterprise risk management, mm -hmm. but we have other departments as well that work collaboratively and, uh, and integrate with uh, enterprise risk management. So we have an information security function, we have a third-party vendor risk, we have a risk assurance team, and we have uh, a systemic and liquidity risk management team as well. They all have specialties in their own areas, but the ERM team works closely with those teams, works closely with the first line, and they drive a lot of the things that you'd expect to see. We're, we're predominantly non-financial and operational risk management in what we do, uh, though there are, as you heard, the systemic and liquidity risk, we do have some financial risk management components, but we how, how do we incorporate all of those factors of risk work with the first line, drive things like risk and control self-assessments, 
key risk indicators, driving a common risk taxonomy, defining risk appetite statements, uh, risk culture and driving risk culture through, all the, all, through the organization. These are all things that the ERM team own, drive, and, uh, and are critical to the, uh, uh, to the effective functioning of, of risk management at the firm. Thank you. That's more in line with what we would normally expect. So that's okay. that's good. You, <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, risk. Well, everybody does it differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's more yeah. uh, comprehensible us that way. Um, you, you you mentioned a number of things. I was going to say risk appetite. Can you start with the risk appetite? Everybody defines risk appetite differently. Uh, how do you define it? So risk appetite is quite near and dear to my heart, actually. Um, to the point, to the extent that you can get emotional about, and romantic about risk appetite. <laughs> but um, what I found in, in my career is risk management can get very confusing and opaque um, to your first line, to your business owners, um, if you don't define the right risks that they should care about, right? So you know, you can say, well, what are the risks you care about? You can pick from a whole menu of different risks. I care about vendor risk. I care about technology falling over. I care about a fat finger error in a system. I care about an employee going rogue. I care about a pandemic. That would never happen. Don't worry, guys. But like, there's a whole slew of different things that, that maybe you care about. But then the question really is why, right? And, and I take a little bit of a, I, I sometimes joke with my team, like, if ever, if any of you have young kids or have you know family with young kids, right? You get a toddler or a young kid is always asking you why, and you answer, and then you ask they ask why again until you get to an answer. Ultimately, why do you care about risk management? Why do you care about these risks? And really, what it comes down to in most organizations is, uh, we as an organization have some things that we are trying to achieve. These are our objectives. This is these are our strategic objectives. These are the fundamental things we care about whether it's you know, making profit, building clients, uh, managing money effectively, moving payments through a payments network and satisfying those needs for, for our customers. There are a slew of things that you should be able to articulate. These are the fundamental things, non-negotiable thing, non things that we care about as an organization. You need to have that conversation first and agree on those. Once you do, once you have that conversation, then you can start having a conversation about well, what are the things that could stop you meeting those objectives? Those are your risks. Those are the risks you care about. And that should be, in my mind, the linchpin of how you define risk appetite statements. Because when you start to define those risks, then you can say, this is what I'm trying to achieve. These are the risks that could impede me getting there. And how much of that risk am I willing to take for me to still meet my objectives? Then you can start having a conversation about appetite. Now, the interesting thing there is it's not just about ends justifies the means. So let me take an example with one of our one of our risk appetite statements. We care a lot about, as you might imagine, operational performance and resiliency. That's one of our, our, our risk appetite statements. But it's not just measuring, okay, we have 100% uptime and, and, and you know, we're able to recover from any failure within this, this level of RTO. No, there are a bunch of things that we need to do as an organization to ensure that that occurs because we don't want to just wait for the bad things to happen. We need to demonstrate we have a set of commitments that we are executing as a firm to ensure that we can get to that outcome. Um, so in our risk appetite statements, we not only define the objectives and the risks for that may impede those objectives, but we also define the commitments that we as an organization uh, are, are are committed to execute? And then what are the risks around those failing? So do we have an effective business continuity uh, uh, and disaster recovery program? You know, are we managing vendor risks appropriately? Uh, do we have good governance around our technology delivery? Do we have a strong software development life cycle? And do we have strong governance around that? You know, and on, on do we have model risk uh, uh, evaluation? And what are the risks around those? And those will tie in ultimately to that objective of, you know, are we operationally resilient and performant? So it all ties through to business strategy and objectives, and you need to measure those risks in the context of that. I can't, I can't emphasize for me how important that is, because then when you sit down and you have a conversation with, you know, a senior executive on the board or a business line owner, and you're walking through risks and the appetite, 
you can have it in the context of something that's meaningful for them. Yes, I as an operations leader, I, I understand why I need my, my, my payments network to be up 100% of the time or close to it, right? Um, but if I just say, you know, we're seeing these vendors over here and that's part of your appetite statement without that context, it's very hard to have a conversation that's meaningful for them. So I'll pause there. Obviously, that makes sense, but it's really important. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I just want to ask a few follow-up questions yeah. so I really understand what, what you're doing. Uh, it sounds like your, your risk appetite statement is um, a qualitative list of the risks and aligning them to the strategic objectives, describing how they could impede it, and maybe, I don't know if you actually quantify the level of yep, impeding, yep. and then you set that's okay, but not this far. And in terms of likelihood, it's very impact. Right. You do do that, so it's a series of risks. Yep. That you okay. okay yeah. And we do, uh, and just to be clear, so we we you're right. We have qualitative descriptions of saying this is what these are the set of criteria across all of these objectives and commitments that we expect to see for us to be within our risk appetite. This is what we see if we're kind of getting close, a bit uncomfortable, but we're still within appetite. But then we have a series of key risk indicators that have their own risk tolerances, right? And we define our red, amber, green tolerances. So we have some quantifiable measures. The challenge is you can't quantify everything, right? So they're more supporting net, um, metrics that complement the qualitative and they, they should be consistent with each other. But metrics are easier to see on a page flashing red, amber, or, well, they wouldn't flash green, but you know they, they give you some indicator that something that you need to pay attention to this, but it's not, you know, you shouldn't only rely on the on the on the quantitative side, especially when you're dealing with the non-financial risk side, because there's so much of non-financial risk that's just difficult to measure. I, I'd love to see a series of metrics that you can really measure, say reputational risk. That's one of the really hard ones, for instance, right? So you know, things like that are, 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 are tougher. Right. Yeah, that's you all, that's all, we actually should set up another panel for that because that's a great, okay. great topic. We can get okay. into depth on that. Okay. Uh, in, in you know, it's it's nice to hear you're aligning uh, with objectives, um, Very which leads into another question I had, which is, can you tell us what decisions are actually informed? We find that's a great test of the strength of the ERM program. Is like, well, you know, data reports great, but are you actually changing decision making? It sounds like you you are yep. because of your alignment. Can you tell us what types of decisions you're informed? Yeah, so there are a couple of right. So in the operational performance. Um, one thing that's, that, that has become a lot more apparent through the way that we've structured our appetite statements, our KRIs and our reporting on top of them is there's one of our, one of the operations areas with our payments network is still very, very highly manual, right? Um, so, you know, there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of it that's automated, but there's a lot of, there's significant chunks of this operational piece that are manual. And, and so we have key risk indicators that look at, say, delays in settlement or data errors that have caused there to be um, some errors in uh, errors in payments processing um, and what that means in terms of our overall resiliency and performance. And what that's driven has been uh, uh, an escalation and elevation all the way up to board level of areas that are potentially problematic that we need to address. And as such, this has it's not been the only contributor, but it's really shone, helped to shine a light on whole initiatives that the technology organization has now spun up to start to automate uh, and, and control where things can't be automated around these areas, right? So, you know, some things can't be automated, but it requires, you know, more rigorous procedures and review sign off. Um, it, it requires more, uh, and, and there's an investment now in improved tooling that allows, you know, if there is an error for there to be uh, more effective sort of forensic analysis so you can get to the bottom of what the error is more quickly and solve it and, and get the settlement out the door more quickly. Um, so some of the initiatives that are being driven now through our operations and technology organization uh, are, I wouldn't say as a direct result, but definitely heavily informed by what we're relaying in terms of our, our risk. Goal. Another area which is important is around um, strategic risk, right? So one of the things that we're focused on, I mentioned about real-time payments, it's the, the future of payments, right? But uh, the real-time payments network, uh, we have certain goals around adoption, right, of, of this payments network. Now it's, uh, now, it's not as simple as saying, just turn it on and all the banks use it, right? There are lots of different use cases that you can use real-time payments on. 
I'll give you some examples, right? Say you want to pay your utility bill, right? And it's useful for, um, say, Verizon to send you a request for your bill, and then you can pay it instantaneously. That's something Verizon would be very interested in. They don't need to wait for a couple of days and wonder whether your check is going to clear or not. You press that button and it goes to you. You go out for dinner with some friends and you want to split the bill, right? And you say, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, we're going to split it this way. You pay it through Zelle or through Venmo. RTP is lying in the back in the background, and that's what it uses. Instantaneously, it goes to your friends' accounts. You're an Uber driver and you want to get paid um, for each trip, right? You put the the, uh, the the customer presses pay and it goes instantaneously to the Uber driver. These are all different use cases that RTP can use could use. The adoption rate and how we get that adoption. I know I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but this is the adoption rate. Some some of these use cases have been adopted more quickly. Some have taken more time, and there's risk that we've defined in our risk appetite statements around the expectations and the need for adopting RTP. And we shine lights on areas where there needs to be more focus on adoption. There, obviously, it's not like our product development and business people are running blind to this, they're aware of it, but it helps shine a light on what that means for risks to the firm if we're not meeting our strategic objectives in a more in a clearer, more succinct way. So that's another thing that 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 gets a lot of light and attention in our committees and our, our board meetings as well. And that the ERM team and how we've structured this really helps with that. So if I'm I'm just gonna reflect back what I'm I think I'm hearing. Tell me if yeah. I'm off here. It sounds like the the kind of information because of the way you're approaching this about strategic decisions uh st strategic objectives and then uh and the, what information you're giving to support decisions is that you're giving another way of looking at this that helps support the business decision yeah the strategy is there but you're supporting it and then they're able to check off okay this is now moving forward that's moving forward because of the additional context and color you're providing yeah is that fair uh, that's fair i mean it's, it's um and you would expect that more to be in most cases, right? Um, the, the, the worst possible case for the business is if risk are discovering these things first, right? <laughs> if risk are discovering things first, that means you've got some serious deficiencies in your business. They don't even have awareness of their own risks, right? It does happen, right? We've had cases that that happens. Well, I'll say this. The worst, the real worst case is if internal audit find it, right? <laughs> right? Because that means your risk, your second line hasn't found it and your first line hasn't found it. But, you know, you ideally you want your business line, your first line to be aware of it, but maybe it's not being contextualized in the right way. It's not being aligned to like, you know, comprehensively across the organization, what should we care about? Risk to a, a, a pivotal uh, or, or a very important, play a very important role in articulating that in that framework. And I find that that's something that ERM you know does uniquely well. Is mm -hmm. is oh, a lot of things going on, well intentioned, but when you have the overarching view, you're able to say, based on all of our priorities, they all aggregate and integrate. We have limited time, attention, and resources. We need to put more here to ensure this happens. Exactly. So this initiative should take higher priority. Are there any things also can be deprioritization? Is there any examples that you can share about something that was deprioritized investment or decision or? Yeah, I mean, um, so on the on the product space, there's there's a lot of focus on ideation, new new product ideas, um, and you know, again, not just a risk decision, but when you're making um, if you, when you're making a a cost benefit around, you know, you want to have adoption of a product line versus how much time are you going to invest in potentially some new products or new ideas, or even sustaining uh, a product line that maybe isn't performant or aligns with the overall product strategy. Sometimes that's not clear um, until you contextualize it in the overall framework of what your strategic goals are and what the strategic risks are around it. So, you know, we do make decisions about stop investing in this product line, or let's defer this until we've focus more on this area and that kind of aligns from a risk perspective as well. Um, it sounds like it is in a lot of strategic decisions. Is it formally also in your strategic planning process, your formal process? Yes. It's, yes, it's it part is. of it. it okay. Excellent. Can you, just get a little bit more granular on the steps. Can you describe how you conduct your qualitative risk assessments uh, to identify potential key risk? Give us some granularity there. 
Yeah, I mean, there are lots of angles of those are qualitative risk assessments can come in many different flavors, right? But um, I think what's really important is providing a, a strong construct by which you can, can do this in a structured way. So let's take risk and control self-assessments. I assume uh, the, the audience here are familiar with what those are, but just at a very high level, you're really looking at all the activities, the processes in an organization, breaking them down, and then you want to identify all the risks within those processes, what could go wrong, um, and, and how bad could it be, and how good are your controls in mitigating those, and then overall, what's your, what's your residual risk exposure, and are you comfortable with that? Well, you can just have a very loosey-goosey, free-form conversation, but that makes it very difficult to make something that's consistent and actionable across the board. So one of the things, you know, we're working towards evolving this, but we start with a risk taxonomy, right? A, a, a menu of risks. You're feeling hungry, which risk do you want, right? <laughs> and so it's like, you know, but if you have this menu of risks, it forces people to think about risks that they may, that may not be front and center of their mind. If I'm in operations, I may be thinking a lot about, well, first, a lot of organizations think primarily about their controls first. Um, to me, that's a very old school mindset in risk management because you could look at, say, I've got 10 controls and they're all working perfectly. It's like, I'm great. But what you don't know is you're missing five <laughs> because there are these risks out here that you're just not mitigating at all. So you need to start with your list of risks that are relevant to you. And there may be some risks that you haven't thought of as a first line. And, and the second line's function is to really provide that structure and, and, and get, the, get the juices flowing on the first line to be able to articulate, oh, actually, yeah, this is relevant to me. I have some real reputational risk here and I haven't really even thought about it. Or, you know, there's some information security risk here that, you know, actually, because we don't have processes around X, Y, and Z about, I don't know, onboarding or access management or, you know, you know, vulnerability management um, that I actually need to think about that a little bit more. And maybe it's not something that I manage in my process, but I'm affected by it, by some other process. So it forces that kind of mindset, right? So we have what the second line does is we sit and we have, uh, you know, uh, conversations with the first line about their processes so we can understand their processes. We can walk through all the risks that are potentially relevant to them. And then we can start to have the conversation about quantification, like how bad could it be? And that, and the important thing there is, has to tie back to risk appetite because risk appetite is what the firm cares about. So as we quantify that, we're saying, well, how bad could it be in these dimensions of appetite for the firm? And then you can start to have the control conversation once you get there. So, yeah. And at a high level, that's what we do for RCSA, but it's a similar thing for if we're doing issues and incident management work and we're trying to assess, you know, not only how bad was this incident or how bad could this issue be, um, but it's not just, you know, what you've experienced, but also what the potential is. So you have a similar kind of conversation there. Uh, if we do targeted risk assessments for, you know, uh, a product enhancement or a or a new product or a new business transaction. It's a similar kind of conversation there. Um, so a lot of it is just sitting down with the business, but you want some kind of structured framework that you can start with to help them think in this kind of in this dimensionalized way about the kinds of risks that are relevant, um, the tie back to risk appetite, and then you can start to talk about controls and your ultimate risk exposure. Yeah, you know, it's kind it's kind of like a exciting time. Maybe you can uh, comment on this when you when you do move more towards a, a strategic objectives based focus. Yeah. So you ask the question, risk in terms of what? In terms of that objective, as you mentioned, you call it risk appetite. You're aligning it that way, and then get them to think about the taxonomy, which is probably more of a risk category subcategory kind of list because you can't let me go total risk list, right? But then the, getting them to think about all the different areas that could affect that. And then get down to business in terms of, yeah, you know, what's really going to make a dent here. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you probably saw that when you first instituted it, the mind shift. And even as new new people come on board of the organization or new people come in to this function, yeah. And you, when you go through that exercise with them, what I find is you're, you're getting information at the same time as you're pushing gently through Socratic questioning and education, advancing the risk cultures that one by one by one is starting to think. And then many people that have been around a while worry about something over here very quickly and thinking it through, they realize 
even an incredible worst case, it crumbles in their hands. It's like, it's annoying. It's some overtime, but it's not really going to make a dent in that that objective that way. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit, uh, just comment and reflect on that? And then I want to use that to pivot towards, because it's connected, how do you actually do quantification? Because you mentioned you want some quantitative expression of how bad could it be? So let me make sure so I understand. First on the risk culture. Yeah, yeah. so, so let, me, let me make sure I understand the question is the question that um, are there cases where, because often where we focus in risk management is, uh, and what I just talked about is there may be risks that the first line aren't aware of, but if I'm understanding your question, are there risks that sometimes the first line think are very important, but then when you have the conversation, they're actually maybe not. Right, it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah, Some, yeah. Sometimes things may be more, even more damaging than they think when they think about it in the context of, yeah, multi-year impact on, you know, on whatever metrics you care about. And then the other way around too, it just that alignment uh, and the ahas that go on, even with people that know that because they know their business, right? Yes. They're closer to the risk of the business, but you're giving them a way of thinking about it that starts to align the educate and the risk culture and those ahas that go on. So just to, if you can reflect on that and then talk about some of those in the context of what numbers do you require? What do you yeah. get to? Yeah, well, I'd say I'd say that Latin case of, you know, first line feeling that there's a risk that's really important. And then when you kind of dig in, it's actually not that important. I think those cases tend to be rarer, um, just more, I mean, it obviously depends on the organization, but if you have some level of maturity in the first line and that they really know their business, I I found it rarer in my experience that they're jumping up and down about a risk. And then actually when you dig in, it's 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 less of a risk. Mm. Uh, I find it's more more likely to be the case that there are just risks that they're oblivious to because it's not front and center in their day-to-day -day operations, but it's something that could truly impact them from maybe something externally to them, right? One of the challenges with doing something like RCSAs is all of these processes are interconnected. You can't just look at your universe in isolation. You know, there's lots of things that you depend on and maybe those because you don't manage them that you don't necessarily have, uh, you know, you, you, they're, they're not sort of on your radar as much and ERM plays that role. So I see there's there's maybe less of that though. I, 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 can't, I can't think of an example to hand of a risk that a, first line has been jumping up and down on and we said actually it's not that big a deal there are definitely ones where we have discrepancies of of um opinion on the level of of risk exposure um you know we're in a we're actually in a a heated conversation now around one particular risk that's in our rcsa I see sobia over here is going to be a kind of furrowing her brow and, and stressing her back because it's causing us a bit a bit of delay but there is a lot of back and forth we're having with the first line about really articulating what that risk is but for the most part i think um where the challenges are are just agreeing on the level of quantification not necessarily this you think it's high and we think it's low or we think it's high and you think it's low for the most part is let's just normalize that um now when you you know, taking that to your question around quantification, like how do we how do we measure these things? Um, it all it all goes together, right? So if you talk about appetite, right? If you remember what I said earlier about appetite, is there are two in my mind there are two components to it. There's objectives, like what are the things you're trying to achieve as an organization, and commitments. What are the things that you do to try and meet those objectives? We take the same approach in how we look at our taxonomy. Um, and this is something that we're working on re-engineering now. Um, it's a little bit of a different tack that you see than you see at most organizations. What you see in most banks, financial institutions at least, with a with a risk taxonomy is kind of a tree structure, right? You've got like a level one, level two, level three, whether it's based originally on Basel or it's, you know, or it's some customization of that for your organization. We've taken a little bit of a different approach because there are two different ways of looking at risks. There's risks of the organization as a whole being impacted. And then there's risks related to drivers or causal things, right? These are things that could cause this impact. And the problem is any one impact could be driven by multiple drivers and any driver could cause multiple impacts. So we've decoupled those. We have a taxonomy for drivers and we have a taxonomy for impact. And that's uh, and the impact level ties to our appetite. So how much reputational risk do we care about? 
how much information security risk do we care about, how much operational performance and resiliency, legal and regulatory, strategic, systemic and liquidity risk. These are impacts to the firm that tie directly to our objectives in our risk appetite statement. And then when we talk about systems falling over, people, process, systems, external, and then we have a few other categories and a bunch of subcategories, these are all drivers. Those are the types of risks that we care about, but how do we quantify them? We quantify them on the impact scale. Okay, for this um, SDLC technology break, how bad is it, right? How bad is it reputationally? How bad is it strategically? How bad is it systemic and liquidity risk uh, from a systemic and liquidity risk uh, scale? And we have scales on each of those measures. You know, like a four grade scale, people do it differently. You can have a low, moderate, high, very high. And you have qualitative measures for the most part, apart from financial, which is easier to, to have quantitatively. Um, but you have qualitative measures in each of those buckets to tell you how bad is it? And you can point to that for each one of those risks. It's a little bit difficult to describe without a whiteboard, which doesn't really lend itself to these. Uh, <laughs> we all want to <laughs> But um, uh, fundamentally, and this is part of, we, we have an uh, initiative now that we're trying to uh, normalize our risk measurement across risk, because this is something that wasn't set up before I came to the organization. And we're sort of, we're, we're in the uh, somewhat early stages of, of, of defining this, but it's really important because where I've seen things like risk and control self-assessments fall over is, you end up with results saying, okay, I've got 15 lows, I've got you know six moderates, I've got two highs and one very high risks. It's like, okay, what does that mean? It's like, well, it's very high. I was like, okay, what does that mean, right? Can you describe that in the context of risk appetite? Like, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're out of appetite? We're really out of appetite? How bad is it? You need to be able to talk, to be able to, for it to point to some actual criteria that has been reviewed, agreed in partnership with the first line and that aligns to our, your firm-wide strategic objectives um, for it to be meaningful. Otherwise, it's a set of just somewhat, hopefully directionally correct, but mysterious ratings, right? That, that you can't actually point to some real meaning for the organization. So quantification is especially difficult in the non-financial risk space. When you look at market risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, you know, you can build models, you can look at dollars lost over a period of time or exposure to a counterparty. Non-financial is really difficult, right? But you need to be able to define those criteria in a non-mysterious and meaningful way to your business and that aligns with appetite in the context of your, your strategic objectives to the firm. Does so that answer your Yeah, <laughs> Yes, uh, quite a bit of information there. So thank you for that um, yeah. insight. Uh, I get a little excited about this stuff, so you it, can calm me down. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm right there with you. <laughs> so if I understand correctly, you've got your, you. I have a little bit more question about the, yep. about the source and likelihood stuff, but but the severity, you've got the you've got the impact. You've got yep. listed uh, reputational. Somehow you had to find that liquidity, systemic. You have different buckets. You have numeric categories for how bad. Yep. You got qualitative descriptions to go with that, uh, and then you're looking at it in terms of individual events that can cause that. And that, that's how your risk appetite is defined. It's, it's on each, it's each risk source. So the question I would have is, how do you convolute it together to an overall aggregate? So this is, this, this is very timely because we were just having a very heated discussion about this in our ERM team just, just earlier this week. Um, so we don't necessarily look at just individual events, okay? Um, and this is this again is some of the challenge in the non-financial risk space. Because let me ask you a question, right? So you're running um, you're running some function. Let's say it's a you're you're running a, a I keep going back to it, but you're you're reconciling payments, right, on a daily basis, right? Um, and you get one really bad fail, right, in a year, right? Um, let's say it's a $5 million fail, right? Say that's really bad to you as an organization. Okay, that's really bad. Um, but if you get over the course of a year, um, every day, a $100,000 um, fail, which is worse to you, right? So $100,000 fail, that doesn't sound as bad, 
but if it's happening a lot, if it's death by a thousand cuts, that's pretty bad too, right? So for one of the things we're grappling with a little bit, and you know, often you look at this sort of impact likelihood or you try and assign some probability is, it's really important to look at your time horizon and in aggregate, what is the amount of badness that you're willing to take on? And how do you compare like for like? If you just focus on the one-time events without looking at the aggregate, you become, you get yourself into a tricky situation. And each, in, each individual case might be very small, but if it's happening multiple times a day, it's like, what was it, the Superman 3 thing? I can't remember where I, that, that's probably aging out a little bit from the, from the audience here, but there was, a, I think, some, uh, some of the thieves in Superman 3 were trying to like take pennies out of every account like, uh, for, uh, in, in a, a, a vast way. Right, of time. They were making right. millions out of it, right? But no one was going to miss like a couple of pennies out of each of their accounts. I don't know why I'm going to Superman 3, but it, the, the idea is like death by a thousand cuts, maybe something that's far more uh, impactful to you than just one sort of black swan event or one really bad impactful event. You've got to account for all of that. It's not just one or the other. So in aggregate over a period of time, you're going to say, you've got to set your time horizon. Let's say it's a year. How much are you willing to take in terms of potential loss, whether it's financial or reputational or whatever, over that period, taking into account Big events, lots of tiny events, or something in between. In aggregate, how are you? Uh, how do you need to look at it? You've uh, alluded to some of these already, but can you just uh, share with us what are some of the major successes you would tout from your program? Yeah, I mean, some of it is is structural, right? I think none of, none of this stuff works if you don't have a good risk culture in an organization, right? I can sit here and talk about all these fancy risk taxonomies and our amazing risk appetite statements and how we do RCSA so fantastically. Um, but if the first line doesn't care, if your CEO and the board doesn't care, and that is not really kind of rippled down to be into the, in the firm's DNA, you're dead in the water. It's never going to work. Um, and I think what's really important is not just these constructs and method methodologies and mechanisms, but you need to be able to a articulate what this what you're doing in ways that are meaningful for an organization at all levels, from not just senior leadership, but all the way down to you know the operator who needs to press the button, the software engineer who needs to define uh, the requirements, and the QA person who needs to test it or whatever. It needs to ripple down through to everyone, and and. I think what we've done pretty successfully is we've instituted a really good risk culture in that, you know, the second line are not risk managers. The entire organization are risk managers, right? <laughs> they all need to understand, everyone needs to understand their roles in terms of risk management. Um, and that it's it's not, it's part of their job to raise their hand if they see issues, if they're things that could be problems. They, it, they need to know that the second line are not the police who walk around with big sticks beating people if something goes wrong, right? No, the second line are there to help them get ahead of things potentially falling over, right? And, and instituting that culture is, is hugely important. I know it sounds a little bit soft in terms of an achievement, but I think it's, it's a really important one. I think we have, we've instituted a really good risk culture at the organization. We have some metrics around it. We look at you know, proportions of self-identified issues um, uh, as, a, as a proportion of issues that have been highlighted by internal audit. And we want to keep a very high ratio of, because uh, that's a measure of self-awareness by the first line. And I think we, we do pretty well there. Um, and then just so, some of the more, uh, uh, the more strategic impactful stuff, right? Making good decisions about what the firm needs to do uh, in the context of risk. I think the fact that we've managed to articulate risk far more clearly, not just this sea of metrics or, you know, lots of risk, like very dense risk reports, but we've managed to zone in on the things that our business care about and help them make good strategic decisions. Uh, I see that as a huge win because ultimately I feel that risk, for risk to be successful, you have to be commercial in that you might have, it doesn't mean that you have to um, concede to everything that you're business people want to do, but you have to think about what you're doing in the context of what the organization needs and its objectives. Uh, I know I keep coming back to that, um, but 
The fact that we've managed to construct our risk office to do that means that we've built the partnership, we've built, you know, we and we've influenced the decisions in a way that's best for the firm and makes us effective rather than this pain in the you know what function that just gets in the way of things getting done, which unfortunately uh, risk can sometimes have a reputation of, of doing in some organizations. Yeah, I think it, it. I think it's exactly right to focus on on and keep coming back to that issue because I, I talk a lot about buying. I think this is one of the major keys to buying. A lot, a lot. There's a lot of resistance in organizations to ERM. Right, yeah. the businesses sit there like this with good reason. Yep. Because the methodology is is swarming in a lot of give me this, give me that repetitively. Yep. People get exhausted with it. They just update something that's not even really updated, and it's not really helping them. Because it's 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 there's no way of organizing it to I have something to make a better decision here, yep. but you've begun that way yep. with the objectives, and I think all the energy and the buy-in comes from okay now you're helping keeping me safe, helping me get done what I know needs to get done, and making it more likely I'm going to get to my objectives individually and collectively as an organization. Yeah, is that uh, that's right, that's right. And listen, it's hard because you're not not everyone is starting fresh, right? I I think I mean we already had a risk function before I joined TCH, so it's not like I can come in and design it from scratch. I've had that advantage before in my career, but I've also you know worked at big banks where you have these monolithic risk functions that are already set up, and it's it's harder to change once they're already instituted. You know, you work at a three hundred thousand person organization, and they already have a risk and control self assessment program set up, and you're like. How do I change this, right? And it's it can be hard because if it's already been instituted as a check the box exercise that takes you know a year and a half to complete a cycle, and then you hand over a bunch of risks to the first line and say, well, thank you for giving me that year and a half old uh, information I already know about and I've fixed a, I've fixed most of it already, then it becomes you, you, there's no wonder why risk management gets a bad reputation. It's it's useless to them, right? But you know, to get that buy-in, it's really, you know, it's show me, right? You've got to show them that you can make these changes that are meaningful, impactful. And and it, and it's a, it can be a grind, but it's a, if you have the right mindset and with, and you can communicate things in the right way, and then you can demonstrate things with these wins, you can get there. And I think we've done, you know, we're, there's a lot more that I want to do at TCH, but we've done, we've done a pretty good job at it. Here. Well, I'm not, not, I, I'm curious, what, what are some of the remaining challenges ahead? Well, you know, you know, I talked about risk taxonomy. We talked about measurement. There's definitely work I want to do to, to uh, normalize that across the organization. Like one of the things I inherited, and this is very natural, you see in an organization, you have a lot of different functions that have all stood up the way that they've done it in similar but different ways. So you're measuring risk in five different ways in five different parts of the organization. Um, you don't necessarily have them tied to appetite. They're not necessarily using the looking at the same menu of risks in each space. So how do you get an overall view of, you know, what do I care about and what's really bad versus what isn't bad? So that's work that we we really want to do. That's a you kind know, of norm, normalizing um, and instituting a common taxonomy and common measurement is a big deal for us. We have um, we still do a lot of things manually. We do our RCSAs in spreadsheets right now, which uh, I'm sure people would gasp in horror at the fact that we do that. But, you know, we um, we currently use um, a GRC tool um, for our issues management that isn't very flexible. So we're doing some proof of concepts on some potential uh, new GRC tools. And the idea is we want it to be flexible enough and configurable enough that we can build it in a way that's right for our organization. Risk management can't be done as a cookie cutter approach. You know, some of the tooling that you see out there, uh, at least some of the older ones are very, you know, you have to do it the way that they have it set up and it doesn't necessarily work for you that way. So we want to get everything in a system which will allow us to have, you know, constant, uh, consistent data, controlled mechanisms for how we measure it, easier reporting. So it's a lot of kind of uh, automation and, and getting things into a system is a big thing for us. But that's, you know, that takes a lot of design and a lot of thought because, it's not just the tool, it's the design that goes into that tool as well. So that's a big focus for us. This is just kind of the support mechanisms that will help us do our job more effectively and consistently. Yeah, technology and tools can trap because if ERM is working really well as a strategic yeah. uh, decision-making support, uh, it needs to stay flexible and dynamic. And a lot of people institute tools and then it, it's sold in and then it's a trap yeah. because it's like, well, 
we could support that decision, but we're gonna have to massively change yeah. it and it's too late. Yes, exactly. So then you're exactly. out of the game. Yeah. yeah, you've got to be nimble with this stuff as well. You've got to have the yeah. ability to, to, to change and adapt. You get Quickly. your fundamental constructs set up, but then you need to be able to adapt. It's, it's hugely important. Hey, can I, if I could shift gears for a minute, what, what's your approach to communications with regulators on ERM? Um, one word, transparency. Really, really important. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's not just one word, but that's kind of the basic tenet, right? Um, you need to build a, a relationship of trust with your regulators, otherwise you're just gonna create a lot more pain, right? It's a, I've seen in other organizations, I've, I've sometimes, sometimes seen this feeling of fear when you have your, your regulators kind of looming, right? It's like, don't tell them where all the bodies are buried. It's like, I will walk them out into the backyard and point to all the graves, right? It's like, these are all the things that we know are potentially problematic. These are the things that we're trying to, th these are the things that we're trying to work through to resolve them. These are the things we think you guys should be concerned about. Um, you know, what you're trying to prove really is not that there's nothing wrong in your organization. You're trying, because they know there are always going to be things that are wrong or problematic in your organization. It's like, are you aware of them? How are you thinking about them? What are you trying to do about them? Um, now, obviously, there's transparency is not just a binary thing, right? You don't want to sort of, uh, if you open up every single nook and cranny, um, you could actually end up causing pain for both you and them because then they're not they're, they're not seeing the, the the forest for the trees, right? They might be focusing in on lots of minutia where you need to kind of uh, articulate the things that are kind of most impactful. But if they ask questions like we, we try, I spend a lot of time with our, our, our regulators, a lot of time, um, but it's really important to really build that, build that trust. Um, and for them and to demonstrate to them that we're ahead of these things. And you know, we've we've had um we've had some really good results in that, you know, many years ago, um, before I, I was part of the organization, and I'm not saying this is just me, but we had a lot of regulatory findings and we were in uh, the, the regulatory uh relationship was not as strong at all. Um I think we're probably in the strongest position we've ever been with our regulators. And, you know, we've, you know, we, we, we have sort of metrics to prove that as well. But if you try and get defensive or try and obfuscate or hide things, that, that's a, you're dooming yourself. You're going to get into a lot of trouble. You know, it, it's interesting. Anybody that's ever done a project in an organization across the entire organization. Yeah really gets a sense you know where your strengths and weaknesses are with people with capabilities yeah. with technology you can just see it because you quickly get a comparison yeah so anybody that's ever done that knows the regulators are doing that yeah they're seeing a wide swath they can tell the difference yeah it's very clear with nothing to see here they can see that they understand it. so you don't have credibility yeah and and they get that i, I hear that a lot from regulators like yeah. people don't think we know we know we're not showing us stuff we we know it so the only the, the the interesting thing there, and I, I will highlight this, is um, sometimes what you see is so we're TC. One thing I didn't mention about TCH is we're relatively small, right? We're five hundred people as an organization, which I actually love. Which means you don't have a lot of bureaucracy. You can get a lot of things done. You get a lot of visibility, um, but you can't regulate a 500 person organization in the same way as you can regulate a Bank of America or a Citigroup, right? It's a very different organization. Um, and there are things that we can, you know, things that, that we're set up to do um, in ways differently from an organization. And sometimes that can be where there's a bit of a tussle, right? Because, you know, you'll have regulators who have experience, you know, supervising a lot of the large banks and they come to, you know, uh, a market utility like TCH, and they say, well, where is all of this stuff that we'd expect to see? It's like, well, one, we're not set up to do that, and two, that's maybe not nearly as important or as a priority to us as, as some of these other things, and, you know, there might be some things that we're on a different level of maturity on, and, and so that can sometimes be some of the, the tussle, but it's more healthy conversation than conflict than anything else. Can I ask you uh, if you could describe uh, your risk governance structure? Yeah. Um, so, so as I mentioned, we're we're owned by the largest U.S. 
financial institutions, right? So we have internal governance and then we have governance where those banks oversee us. So we have a number of committees internally um, that manage things like we have our uh, executive risk management committee, which is all our senior leadership. Uh, I, I run that, but we have, you know, our head of operations, technology, finance, um, product development, HR, our CEO is there. Like they, uh, we have regular governance committees where we walk through our risk profile areas where top risks, emerging risks, our CSA results, key risk indicators, the whole gamut uh, of things, key initiatives. Um, we have internal governance around, as you imagine, we're very technology centric. So we have an architectural review board where risk sits on that. Um, and make helps make decisions about architectural changes, technology architectural changes. Um, we have stuff around chips or large payments network, any material changes to that, we're heavily regulated there. That's internal. And then we have our enterprise risk committee, which is our first port of call, where our senior risk executives from each of the banks are members of this committee. And we present and discuss the risk profile at the organization and developments and changes to the profile with them. And it's their job to beat us up, which is welcome. I, I, I wouldn't say I like being beaten up, but I require to be beaten up. But their, it's their job is to challenge us, ask us questions. Are we doing things the right way? Give us suggestions. And then, so that's kind of the, the next level above. And then ultimately we report into uh, the, the board of directors of the organization, which are kind of the, uh, the owner bank representation. And we, we report in there and we play a big part in, in presenting there as well. I, I see we're uh, already past a little time to ask questions. We're probably gonna run just a, a few minutes long so we can, we can take questions from the audience. Sure. Um, before I open up, we had a, a question from uh, online. Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, related to, to your last answer that uh, given TCH supports a number of large institutions in the owned by, uh, that have ERM programs, have they influenced the way risk management is performed at TCA? Yeah, um, I think, um, I mean, the, it's more sort of um, incremental than sort of uh, evolution, but than sort of uh, in material in chunks, but we get, you know, for instance, we, we're doing a lot of work right now in our identity and access management. So, you know, work that we can do to evolve, you know, for instance, moving away from passwords to have like sort of more key management in, in, in critical systems. What's helpful there is on our enterprise risk committee, we have some senior sort of cyber risk experts who are on, on that, uh, cyber and security experts who are on that, who will give guidance on the best technologies or the pitfalls you can get into in terms of trying to evolve a program. You know, that kind of stuff is very useful to us because They've been through those challenges where they've tried to stand up certain programs or the GRC tooling, for instance, there's, you know, what you'll find in, uh, often in banks is they've gone through the pain of trying to use off the shelf tools. They haven't necessarily found something that's off the shelf that's configurable. So they'll build something in house and then they've just deferred their pain internally. So having all of that institutional knowledge and the guidance of here are the things that you should be concerned about that's helpful too. So it's more of that sort of guidance kind of thing. I wouldn't say there's something like, hey, you've missed this massive chunk of your of, of your risk program that you should focus on. But that that kind of guidance and experience is, is, is helpful to us. Um, Let's uh, open it up to the floor here. Any uh, questions? Yes, please. The uh, I think there's a, a microphone right there. Oh, thank you. Two quick questions. Number one, there is a new SEC ruling coming out uh, regarding climate crisis disclosure. What's your opinion on that? And number two, how do I avoid groupthink when you have 500 employees and doing the structure? My question is like, when you do geopolitical analysis, uh, talking about China invading Taiwan or India becoming the next investment you know, place for the world, uh, how do you assess geopolitical risk? And how do I avoid uh, group thing? Do you use machine learning or any other technology? Thank you. So when you say group think, um, talk to me a little bit about what you mean by that in terms of 
risk. Groupthink meaning. I mean, I know uh, what groupthink is, but what, what's what's what? Okay, well, when you do a risk analysis, is everybody thinking about the same risk without having different opinions or cognitive diversity? Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, I don't know whether you know about the Challenger space shuttle that crashed. Yep. That was a big case study. Another one was the Iraq War, where everybody was thinking about the same thing. Uh, other cases like the financial crisis 2008. Yeah, nobody thought about it because everybody was thinking about the same thing with the, with the same perspective. Right. Got it. Got it. Got it. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's an interesting question. Well, I mean. And that that last that very last example you gave about the financial crisis was near and dear to my heart because I was I was working in market risk at Goldman Sachs at the time when that all happened right and um, what was interesting around that time was Goldman actually navigated that pretty well and I think that's really a a uh, largely a testament to its culture right and the culture in an organization has to be whether it's five hundred people. At the time I was at Goldman, it was maybe 35,000 people, or whether you're at JP Morgan, that's 300,000 people. If you don't have a culture that encourages challenge and diverse viewpoints, right? If you don't have that, then you're then you're very much at risk from group of group thing. I don't want like Sobia's here. Hopefully she won't. Uh, Sobia's on my uh, one of my VPs in my uh, ERM team. What well, hopefully she'll, but you shouldn't have to uh, attest to is. I ask my team all the time, tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm thinking about things, that, that I'm missing something. I'm not thinking about things in the right way. I want my people to be telling me that I've made a mistake or that I'm not thinking about things right. If everyone's just telling me, yes, I mean, you got it right. I'm in trouble, <laughs> right? So you've got, to, you've got to invest in that mindset, right? You, and, and part of that is, you know, your team needs to feel empowered to make their decisions to challenge, stand up and, uh, and, and and not feel they're going to get squashed or 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 um, devalued or not listened to if they don't voice an opinion. I have to have a culture that 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 supports that. It's it's hugely important. Um, I think that worked at Goldman at the time, right? The the market risk team, you know, they were looking at, you know, what uh, they were looking predominantly at value at risk in terms of the market risk side. And they're saying things are going in a very weird direction. We don't know what's causing it, but we know that something's wrong and we need to start having some discussions with the business to understand what we need to do to hedge that, right? That was, you know, it was, and I, I think the real testament to that wasn't that we knew, we knew that so, we knew what was bad. It was more like we, people had to stand up and say, I don't know what the hell's going on here and be brave enough to do that and then drive the conversations to work out what's going on. You have to be brave enough to say, I don't know or I don't agree, or, you know, it's not, don't just make this model work, right, and just adjust your parameters, so it's like, no, it's probably something that's off, let's remove these outliers and tweak these parameters, and now everything's okay, you, you, you saw that a lot in organizations, and uh, it wasn't the only thing that went wrong in, the, in 2008, there were a whole slew of things that went wrong in 2008, but that was a, a big challenge around model risk at that time, where people were really either relying on their models they're saying well this model is telling me that everything's fine when clearly there are some other things that aren't but we're okay let's just listen to the model you know you've got to have that healthy skepticism right and encourage that culture i think that's hugely hugely important thank you i think that's a really good point because there's always a diversity of thought it's a matter of listening it getting it out yes, yes. so it's there. After a major failure, there's always somebody in the middle of the organization was saying, I, I, I was there, yeah. but nobody either. They beat them down. They didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And there's that moment in a lot of projects or modeling where something's off. Never, No model is ever perfect when it's built, right? You, right. you, you work it, work it, constantly work it. But there's sometimes there's, there's something there. And people get that feeling, that instinct. Something's really wrong, but they're like, man, if those that dismiss it, they eventually go down. That's totally right. Those that say, I'm not satisfied. I'm going to keep attacking this until I figure it out or get comfortable with it. Yep. Yeah. That's, so it's a great uh, point you raised. Totally, totally, um, so totally. thank you for that question. Um, let's take um, just one more question. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, just to continue on the culture aspect and how can you change a culture in a company? Um, I worked in a bank in the, in the market uh, department. and one of the order I had when risk management called me 
my boss told me, okay, you just don't answer anything they're asking you. And the culture was mainly race departments. We don't want to cope with them. We don't want to talk to them. How can you change a culture like that? Because that's really tough, I believe. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a, that's a problem, right? Um, I mean, part, part of it is construct, right? How is, there, how is, the, how is the company organized? Like, like one thing that was interesting to me at somewhere like Goldman was the risk organization didn't report up to the same leadership as the business line. So you don't, you're not worried as a risk function that ultimately the business line are going to override you. It's set up to be a healthy challenge, right? It's set up to be that way. So then your, your ultimate boss can go toe to toe with their ultimate boss and, and have, uh, uh, and have that conversation. So separation of roles, responsibilities, uh, and um, ultimately sort of career and compensation and all of those other things that can be tied up with it that can be those pervasive things that make you worried at the back of your mind. If I, if I annoy that person, what's my career gonna look like here? You don't wanna have that as something that's influencing how you, how you make decisions in your organization. But I mean, again, and I'll say it like, none of this really works without um, buy-in from the senior leadership, right? Like, so we're in an interesting position here at TCH where we just have a new CEO who's just joined just, I think it's a little over a month ago. Now our prior CEO has just retired. Um, and one of the great things with him is he understands fully that uh, risk culture tone at the top is non-negotiable, right? And it's a, it's a priority for him. And it's making sure that that message is loud and clear in all the communications he has, not only with our board and our senior leadership, because that's the easy stuff, to be honest. It's, you know, he's town halls or meet and greets and one-on-ones and, you know, sending out regular communications to the entire organization you know, raise your hand if you see things that are that that are that are off. You will not, you will you will be encouraged to do it, not punished to do it, right? And it's it's really making sure you you hear that from your CEO that makes a big difference, right? Um, and and knowing that there are repercussions if you don't have that mentality as well, right? Um, people need to be if anyone tries to hide something material, um, that's a that's a big problem. That's that to me is is where you should be getting in trouble, not not raising the issue. You can have the healthy conversation. Even if you disagree, you're ultimately going to get to a decision, right? That if you've got the right risk mindset all the way through the organization, that you can, uh, that, that you can get to a, a, an answer that's, you know, the right one for the organization. But, you know, if the construct isn't set up right and you don't have tone at the top right, none of it, none of it can really work effectively. I don't, I'm not sure if that helps you with your... It, it helps in a way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's hard to it's hard to fix if you don't have that, right? If you're working in that organization, you're like, what can I do? It's like you're you're very much more constrained, right? And I I under, I've worked in those those environments too, and it's a, it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, or it makes it challenging anyway. Yeah. So uh, thanks everyone for hanging in a couple extra minutes. We're gonna uh, close the event now. We're gonna close by uh, please join me in thanking Simeon for taking time out of his busy day to come with us today. Thank you.